Hi everyone, thanks very much guys. Thanks very much for that view from Silicon Valley. So, uh, lining up today, uh, now we have fraud prevention in 2017. Security threats, online threats, fraud prevention. Uh, they're big topics right now, particularly in the FinTech space. So has the industry overlooked uh, any required measures? Uh, what do we need to look to in the future? What threats are coming down the line? So uh, in conversation with Reuters' Eric Oshar, um, we have uh, the founder and CEO of Pindrop, that's Vijay Balasubramanian, uh, the SVP of Advanced Security Research and Government at Cisco Systems, that's Greg Ackers, uh, and the Managing Director of, uh, at Authentix, that's Ron Outsman. Please welcome them to the stage. Some nice space. Yeah, no problem. Beautiful. Great. Thanks, everyone. So, for this panel, we're going to try to tell you a few things you may not already know about fraud prevention. Um, each of the speakers comes at it from a, a slightly different angle. Some are really focused on the mechanics of fraud prevention, some see fraud prevention as kind of just elemental to the overall um, sort of cybersecurity, attack defense uh, issues that they address in their business. So maybe I could start, Vijay, um, maybe you could just summarize kind of how you see fraud prevention and what Pindrop brings to it. Absolutely, so uh, we play in the space of voice security and voice authentication. So we focus largely on uh, call centers. So you know, if you, if you, any enterprise like a bank, insurance, retailer, telco, the way they typically interact with their remote customers if they want to find out who they are is by asking a bunch of questions. What's your date of birth? What's your mother's maiden name? What's your social security number? And what we're finding is uh, now that a lot of online and web security systems are in place, a lot of fraudsters are moving to the voice channel or the phone channel. Uh, and ultimately, they're beating a lot of these questions. So for example, one of my favorite calls is uh, when this fraudster calls into this bank and the bank says, what's your mother's maiden name? His answer is, my dad married thrice, so can I take three guesses? And you know, the call center agent allows him to take those three guesses. But fundamentally, they're using the voice channel as a significant entry point, so much so that 61% of all attacks, all account takeover attacks, start off with a phone call. And the US alone loses about $10 billion to voice authentication. So that's the place we, sp we play in and we see a lot of account takeover starting from data breaches all the way to individual account takeovers happening over the voice channel. Um, based on your company data, where do you see the attacks coming from? Um, I think West uh, Africa features largely, but maybe talk a little bit about where the, where the attacks seem to be coming from. Absolutely, so we see a lot of attacks from West Africa, Eastern Europe, Philippines, uh, and depending upon the uh, organization that we're protecting, uh, some in Mexico and Tunisia as well. And these fraudsters have you know, very colorful personalities. Uh, you know, one of the things is that every time we catch a fraudster, we name a conference room in Pindrop after that fraudster. So you know, the fraudsters out of Philippines, because there are a lot of roosters out of there, there's a very fa famous fraudster called Chicken Man, because every time he calls into one of these banks and steals money, uh, you know, there's, there's a constant rooster clucking in the background. So, you know, it's, 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 it's spread across these areas, which I think is similar to a lot of other fraud. Great. Ron, you want to just describe kind of what you, how you approach the issue? Yeah, well, we are, hi everybody. We are uh, basically uh, uh, an image processing shop, and our core competence is we check documents, identify documents. Um, we come from uh, immigration, basically. We've been uh, eating documents for uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the past uh, 20 years. And about 10 years ago, we understood that uh, the business is in the business and not in immigration. So we basically, we are, the, uh, we are at the gate. We connect between the real world and the virtual world, yep. which is the data stuff. So the way we approach... Um, there are different use cases when we approach. It's either for custom onboarding or for um, 
or for risk and fraud mitigation or for KC. Actually, we don't look at it from a fraud point of view. We look at it for, okay, we are a secure customer onboarding tool. And fraud is one of the issues that we deal with, fraud and compliance and conversion. And we do it on a global basis, uh, from uh, US to Europe to uh, Asia to LATAM. Uh, we have uh, uh, customers from the fintech space like um, Pioneer or PayPal or Google, and also um, like old school companies like Renault Nissan Financial, and we're also starting you know, dealing with some uh, new ventures inside the um, uh, BBVA and also insurance companies like in Israel, which is Cloud. So, so we basically, so there is the issue of the, the data, which is people better to use, but you need to connect the data to the person, and we are that first step to make sure that the document the person is submitting, and then we connect to the face, and then we give everything back to our customers, and then they start connecting to the data service, and when they call the call centers, and they try to find if that the, the chicken cow, the chicken person, the, chicken cow, yep. the chicken guy, or the, the, or the turkey guy, or the cow guy, so, um, so then they can start, so that, that's, that comes together with the voice stuff, and I'm sure also with the data stuff. Maybe we could have you, you were describing to me earlier the, the difference in regulatory regimes. Talk about what Britain appears to be doing right these days in, in your field versus, say, what goes on in Germany in terms of... Well, I think, um, well, the, the, the gatekeepers are, are the regulators. So what you see is happening basically when one of the good things David Cameron has done when he came to the UK, he decided he wants to turn the UK to a big um, hub for financial services from a technology point of view, also from services. So he told, uh, I mean like the, the approach that he brought into the market is let's, okay, let's be tech friendly. And you saw, and the reason why you're seeing UK is booming from a FinTech point of view is because of that approach and you know, being a bit open-minded and be willing to accept new technologies. While on the other hand, you see Germany, which is the regulator there is not that tech friendly or he's more in the business of protecting the banks than helping the industry coming up. And that's why, you, for example, you see like, you want to do, <laughs> you want to do, you want to do document verification? So for their concept is having a video conference call with a customer and that's digital banking. While in the UK, the only thing you need to do is to take a document, to do a selfie, and add on top of it, like making sure it's a live person, which you can do like in a small snapshot that you do that, and that's, and that's create a conversion. And that's where, for example, you see that, by the way, there's amazing technology companies coming from Germany, but they're not serving the German market. They're, German, they're serving, they're based in Germany, but they're serving country, serve market which are outside of Germany. You're talking about N26? Sorry? You're talking about N26? N26, uh, Credit Tech, you know, it's like amazing companies, but you know, but there's no real, I mean, of course, if you're, uh, if you're a customer of Deutsche Bank or Commerzbank or the other banks, so you have online banking, but when it comes to the onboarding and allowing real competitive inside the German market, I think they, have need, they need to learn a bit more from what the UK is doing, they're doing the right way. Got it. Greg, you come at this from a much more meta perspective, um, but obviously fraud prevention is one of the, the base issues that affects all of your customers. Talk a little bit about your yeah. role at Cisco and, and how you see this issue. So at Cisco, I'm primarily a cybersecurity guy. And I've been the cybersecurity guy since, since there ever was one at Cisco. I've been there 24 years. <clears throat> we do come at things primarily from a digitization standpoint. We believe that as tech continues to infuse itself into everything that we do, whether it's FinTech or IoT or things like that, we're going to see more enablement through digitization in everything we do throughout the world. And at Cisco, we believe that as those services are consumed and delivered, the commonality of the approach is going to be through the network. And the network should be looked at as the architectural platform on which to base solutions to deal with all things that we think are going to have to do with integrity of data, integrity of operation, integrity of anything that we want to represent digitally. Um, you talked to me about machine learning and the role it can play. I mean, in, in 
fraud detection. Just talk a little bit about sure. how using the network and the traffic in the network. One thing that is absolutely inescapable to either the fraud actor or the consumer of the technology is the transactions occur on the network. You can't lie about the fact that there is something going on on the network. No matter how much the adversary would like to try to find a way to masquerade what they're doing, they still have to use the network. And that fact of use in and of itself can be looked at as an opportunity to watch what's going on, bring information together in a way that otherwise could not be brought together in mass, analyze it and use techniques like machine learning and be able to actually take that information and make sense out of what's going on. I was mentioning to you earlier, I have a researcher who showed me an example of some technical work he was doing on encrypted traffic that he couldn't read, but he could consume enough of what the transaction looked like on the network to the point that I swore that he was actually reading the encrypted text and he wasn't. Yeah, in fact, you know, I'll just add to that if I may, right? The machine learning part allows you to actually do fraud prevention at a much more significant level. Uh, in the space that we play in, in voice security and authentication, we find two huge benefits, right? One, voice recognition has had significant advances because of deep learning. So the same thing that allows you to do driverless cars is allowing much better voice recognition, much better device recognition and things like that. But on the other side, just the fact that there's this branch of machine learning known as reinforcement learning, where you can use the combined wisdom of fraud analysts at all of these organizations to determine what are the new trends. And so that's one of the things that we do, right? Every time we catch a fraudster uh, and, and the fraud analyst con confirms, that reinforcement tells us what factors were most beneficial in identifying that fraud actor. And when we n don't catch that particular fraud actor, again, that reinforcement tells us what new factors do we need to do. So you can actually create a system that's constantly adapting itself to the way fraud actors are moving, and that makes machine learning really powerful in this space. Great. Maybe we could go through some concrete scenarios that kind of break down um, some of the, the more sophisticated attacks you see in your business. Um, Vijay, maybe you could start with you were telling me of one example. Absolutely, so uh, uh, how many of you uh, remember the target attack? Raise of hands? Okay, <laughs> not many, but you know, the target was one of the first data breaches. And you know, a lot of people talk about target as uh, you know, the, the end situation, right? So target was the be all, end all. But target was only the beginning, right? Because once you have a data breach and once you have <coughs> information like credit card numbers or social security numbers, what happens after that? You need to start compiling identities, you need to start creating identities. So the really interesting thing that we saw in, in, in call centers is that after a data breach, we see this massive spike in call volume, tens of thousands of calls, and what they're trying to do is, for example, talk to the self-service portion of the call center, so where you press one to speak in English, two to speak in Spanish, that portion, you can enter a social security number, and that self-service portion will either say, welcome Vijay Balasubramanian, your account balance is so much, or it'll say, I don't recognize the social security number. So immediately after Target, we saw tens of thousands of calls coming into these call centers, punching these social security numbers one after the other, just to see which banks do these identities bank with. Which insurance companies do they have insurances with? Which retailers do they work with? And ultimately creating your online personality by virtue of using the information provided by these call centers. And just by virtue of noticing that those attacks, you can give a lot of reconnaissance data back to these organizations. So it's a very, very concrete attack that ultimately resulted in a lot of cards being shipped, credit limits being raised, but if you monitored a lot of this reconnaissance activity, you could fundamentally shut that activity down. Ron, do you have some use cases of yeah. sort of authentication well, fraud or? Yeah, well actually, of think of fraudsters like water. And water is always trying to find that, that small crack in the wall to penetrate. So, and if you try, for example, uh, one of the stuff that we saw about account takeover in banks is that Basically, people collect the information about that customer, and they know who's, what mobile operator they use. Now, mobile operators—it's—it's—it's uh, uh, like it's like it's like an open zoo. 
You just need to choose the gate where you want to get into that zoo. <laughs> so what people are doing, like they go to the they, they go to a mobile operator, operator shop and say, oh listen dude, I lost my phone, can I get a new SIM card? They don't even ask for the phone. They get a new SIM card based with your name, for example. And then they log into the bank account, I lost my code, can you text me the new code for my bank account? And then they get a code and then they re-enter your code and then they do an account takeover. And then they start playing in your account. Well, that's number one, but there's also a ripple effect because then they use a clean account, which is not even synthetic. It's a good, clean account. Forget about synthetic. Let's put synthetic on the side for a second. And then they go and they, let's say, they go to one of the online lenders. Yes. And they apply for a loan. And they use Yodli or whatever system to get the stuff. And, dude, this is it's a good account. And they go to that lender and they get like 10 grand, 20 grand. So they, so they clean the online lender. And then they clean the normal legit account. And once it's the, 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 you, you, for example, you found out that you had an account takeover, you suddenly get a, a, a call from the online lender says, dude, why are you not returning my, the loan that you took in? And then also the bank says, what's going in your account? So, so it's not just that they take over your bank account, they also use that clean bank account to start attacking multiple vendors. So this sounds yeah. rather state of the art, or how common, how widespread is this? It's um, uh, it, how widespread? Yeah. It's pretty widespread. So it's pretty. It's it's we we seen we're working with different yeah. online lenders, and and they tell us, listen, forget they're trying to. They're, they already know that we have relatively good fraud systems in our front end. What they do, but usually when you need to you need to get to get in some sort of matter to take the loan and to withdraw it from a normal bank account. So they understand that the weak the weak leaks is the banks and the even more weak links is the mobile operators, which they have, a, like, if the banks are trying to innovate, the mobile operating point of sale is in the Stone Age. So they're just <laughs> looking to, they're just looking to, for where, because also if you're looking at the, if you go to a shop of a mobile operator, these sales guys, their churn is like six months, they come and go, they're like, yeah, yeah. they don't really care, they're just coming, they, they pay by the hour, and they don't really care about the fraud. The only thing they care is are they giving you a quick service or selling you a contract, then that's it, they want to let you go home. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Craig, you want to, you had a scenario you uh, wanted to describe. I think it's I wanna, close to home. I want to build on something Ron said though. There is nothing that we're going to envision doing today that are going to cause any of the guys that are out there trying to do things that are harmful to us in the digital world that are going to give up and say enough. They're not going to walk away and say, you're too good, I'm not going to try. If they're well, in, if they're well funded and they have enough time, which many of them do, and their objective is to find a way to do you harm, they're going to continue to work and they'll look for that weakest link and they'll find that weakest link. And I want to go back to the discussion just for a second on machine learning. Machine learning is not a panacea. And in fact, one of the things we're beginning to understand is that some of the malfeasant actors can actually tamper with machine learning systems to cause them to yield results that are either unreliable or inappropriate for what they're trying to do. So we have to be aware that no matter what we do, we have to remain diligent and aggressive in our postures to improve what we're doing day in and day out. I often say to CISOs, what's your secret weapon? What are the things that you're doing that no one else is doing to try to protect your environment? And that's important to learn. And I want to tell you a story about something that happened in our CISO shop inside of Cisco. We had a very senior person who had access to all the technical capabilities of our security protection apparatus fish attack, spear phishing attack, by a very sophisticated adversary that gathered social engineering information about him, gathered a lot of information about his family, and used it methodically over an extended period of time to try to engage him in an activity that would allow them to get access to his credentialing so that he could, that person could then get access to the Cisco security apparatus and thus to Cisco. So my point by saying this is that the sophistication level continues to rise, we have to remain diligent, and we have to be aware that no matter what we do, the guys are, that are out there trying to do this stuff are going to keep trying. Yeah, yeah. Um, you had to do that? yeah you know, that, that's why, right? Like it's one of those things where, you know, two-factor authentication as we know it is fundamentally dead, right? Like because in a lot of these mobile operator cases, the fact that they're sending you an SMS code or sending you some kind of activation, if you can take over the mobile operator, you can take over the account there, and there they're doing it because they want to give you a great customer experience. 
you pretty much are killing that entire two-factor system. So it's, 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 it's interesting. And, and commenting on your spear phishing attack, my, I've gotten uh, a lot, my CFO has gotten a whole bunch of emails from me, apparently, <laughs> saying, why are $20,000 right now? Because I want to acquire this startup, right? And I've never ever said that, right, as a token. I mean, why would you, I mean, it doesn't even make sense that you'd wire $20,000 to acquire a startup, right? Which startup sells for $20,000? So, but it's very, very interesting what they try to do, and they try to make it very, very specific to the organization. So we, we promised this panel would be about, give you some uh, hints as to what you don't know. Um, so I wanted to draw the speakers out on a few surprises. I'm just reminded, I think you mentioned VJ. Um, something that was going on with Amazon Echo. Yep. Just talk a little bit about call centers and their interplay with Amazon Echo. Absolutely. So one of the things is that we, we play in the call center space. Uh, and, uh, you know, for a long time, you know, the fact that you could interact with your call centers with voice was declining. But now as you start seeing newer devices like Amazon Echo uh, and Google Home and smart TVs, voice is coming back in a pretty significant way. And the same attacks that you're seeing at the call center where, you know, for example, I call on behalf of you and take over an account, once you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home in your house and it's connected to your burglar alarm, you need to answer the same question, right? Was it you who shut off the burglar alarm or was it the burglar? And what we're finding is that these Amazon Echoes don't have any sort of security, right? Google Home or Amazon Echo. And you could see this when uh, they had an ad for Alexa. So uh, Burger King had an ad. And on the TV, they said, Alexa, tell everyone what a Burger Whopper is. And all the Alexas in everybody's houses <laughs> reacted and talked about a burger whopper, right? So you can imagine just by speaking on a TV, you could control so many million devices in your house. And so it's very, very important that the same security mechanisms that you're building in your call centers are security mechanisms that you need to build within your home. So we think there's going to be a rapid conversion of all of that between the IoT space, between the enterprise space, and it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a very interesting time. Do you have some? Uh... Yeah, um, well, I think what you don't know is if you're looking for 100% fraud protection, forget it. It's dead. Everybody can be hacked. You're looking for certainty, I give you taxes and death. All the rest, <laughs> you know, it's all about me, how you mitigate it. So, um, so when, I, when we come to work with our customers, we say, listen, we are a decision tool. And you need to take our, our, the info that we give you. And by the way, everybody can be hacked. Even we can be hacked. And, we, and to tell, you know, I have no problem. You know, we miss here and there a few times. But in, in, in the grand scheme of it, OK, it's all about conversion. So that the question is, OK, collect enough data points from companies like Authentix and VJs and Cisco. I mean, like, and converging everything into one solution. So, you know, because what we saw. 10 years ago, and when we started getting it, there was a big move to data. And forget the front end. Now data is very breachable. So the game here is to combine back end together with front end and to collect enough data points in order to get, in order to, to get I mean, like, it's, 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 the question is your appetite. How, it's always the balance, okay, what is your appetite for business against your appetite for fraud? Let me just have you finish. We're running out of time. Okay, very quickly. It's, it is truly a risk reduction game. That's really what we're playing, is we're looking at the things that are at risk, and we're trying to move the risk from an unacceptable state to an acceptable state. One of the things that I think you guys probably don't know is that adversaries will take the defensive tools and tech, techniques and approaches we use and turn around and try to use them themselves to find out how they can avoid being caught. They'll use our defensive tools against us. And I think that's one of the things we all need to think about is there's no one solution. There is no one uh, answer. It's a risk reduction game, and we have to continue to move the ball forward at all states. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.